saw, there are two primary sources of anti-Jewish sentiment uh, on California campuses, particularly at the University of California. Let's see if I can get this to work now. Is it moving? The light's blinking here. It's receiving a signal. There you go. There you go. I just clicked. Okay. <laughs> Good work, Fred. Do it again. Go no, 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 no. Uh, uh, there are uh, two primary sources of anti-Jewish sentiment on California campuses. Wait, where are we? Sorry, uh, you know what? That's it's not at the beginning. I don't know what happened. Uh, you started again. What happens when you put your faith in the house? Technology is different. How do we get this? I know. Anybody anybody want to guess what the what what they are? Right. Okay, that's the first one. So the first one uh, uh, are members of Muslim and pro-Palestinian student organizations. The uh, Muslim Student Association, known as the NSA, at the students were talking about the NSU, the Muslim Student Union, which is the, the, what, what it's called at, at UC Irvine, um, and the Students for Justice in Palestine, otherwise known as the SJP, the Students for Justice in Palestine, they have a presence on almost all California campuses. Uh, these groups have sponsored, as you, as you could see, they've sponsored speakers, films, exhibits, and what we call guerrilla theater, or agitprop, they, with, with dye-in, apartheid walls and, and, uh, and checkpoints, um, and they engage in discourse or use imagery and language that's considered anti-Semitic by the U.S. State Department. Students from the NSA and SJP groups have also been responsible for aggressively confronting Jewish students at pro-Israel events and for disrupting pro-Israel speakers. You may remember back in 2010, it was on the national news about the Muslim students that interrupted Israeli ambassador Michael Oren at UC Irvine. Uh, these students have also been responsible for incidents in which Jewish students have been threatened, physically harassed and assaulted, as well as incidents in which Jewish community property has been vandalized and destroyed. And finally, MSA and SJP students on some campuses have been responsible for promoting boycott, divestment, and sanctions campaigns. Have you heard of those? Yes. Okay. Uh, there are all kinds of boycotts, essentially, we, affectionately known as BDS, as the acronym BDS, as a means of really of delegitimizing and harming the Jewish state, ultimately destroying the Jewish state. These campaigns have often been accompanied by talks and rallies and exhibits, which again use anti-Semitic imagery, rhetoric, and action. For example, in the spring of 2010, the SJP members at UC Berkeley and UC San Diego wrote uh, and lobbied for divestment from Israel, for a boycott of Israel uh, resolutions, which were actually considered by the student senates on both of those campuses. They ultimately both failed, thank goodness, but almost not at UC Berkeley. And at UC San Diego, they've had since then, every year since then, they've had, they've had, uh, they've brought this up, raised this issue in the student senates to boycott Israel. And the problem isn't so much for the Jewish students, the problem isn't so much the, the, uh, boycott of Israel, what that really means, how much money that really means is probably negligible, but what happens on the campus at the times when these, when these uh, issues are being, when these resolutions are being considered is, is really horrific for Jewish students. So the second significant source of anti-Jewish bigotry? Exactly. Did that come up? Right, exactly. Um, anti-Zionist uh, anti faculty. So in classrooms, on class websites, on email lists, and at departmentally sponsored events, on a number of UC campuses, faculty members have advanced falsehoods and distortions about Zionism, Israel, and Jews, as well as statements advocating for the elimination of the Jewish state, and some even encouraging their students to engage in that campaign, in those campaigns. Although their rhetoric is unscholarly, Right? It's not supported by any facts or evidence. It is politically motivated and directed, and it's even at times anti-Semitic. What do these professors claim? What protects them? 
academic freedom. Academic, ac academic freedom. Academic freedom means you're academics, they are protected by academic freedom, or so they claim. In many cases, the faculty responsible for these anti-Zionist and anti-Semitic expressions openly identify themselves as Jews uh, or Israelis. If they, were, if they identified themselves as Muslims, it wouldn't be a problem, at least not nearly as much of a problem as what happens when they identify themselves as Jews or even worse, as Israeli Jews, and they use their religious or national identification to legitimate their behavior or to protect themselves from critique. How could I be an anti-Semite? I'm a Jew. Uh, you may have heard that before. So in the film, you saw, uh, you, you heard about a conference that happened at my university. It was called Alternative Histories Within and Beyond Zionism. And it took place on my campus in 2007. It was sponsored by eight university departments. I mean, legitimate respect, you know, uh, Departments such as history, sociology, anthropology, departments where many of your children, your grandchildren, you may have even graduated from such a department in the social sciences and the humanities. Eight departments sponsored this. Four professors and one graduate student, none of them scholars of Israel or Zionism, though all of them, but they were, their departments were rhetoric, comparative literature, um, how close did we get? Phil, one of them was a film professor writing. So none of them really had expertise in the area of Israel, either political science or something connected to Israel or Zionism. But all of them were self, all five of them were self-proclaimed Jewish anti-Zionists who had previously engaged in political activism against Israel. They all delivered papers that demonized the Jewish state, as you saw, that demonized its founding ideology, Zionism, and that encouraged political activism including the boycott of Israel, the final talk was about how to wage a successful divestment campaign. Okay, that was really the event that galvanized me, that made me say that I really needed to, to continue on and doing what I'm doing. It was, it was a shock. I was in trauma. I was traumatized by the event. My students that went to the event were traumatized by that event. Now I want to talk about, we talked about the sources, the two sources. Now I want to talk about the two effects, the two primary effects of campus anti-Semitism, or at least the ones that I think are most important to us, to this audience here. So in order to understand um, the uh, motivation behind the various responses, which is really what I want to focus on, uh, and to evaluate their relative efficacy, it's important to differentiate between these two primary effects of anti-Semitic behavior. Um, the, previous exam the previous examples highlight the extent to which the university campuses in general, and you see, in this case, campuses in particular, have become a critical front in the war of ideas being waged against the Jewish state and the Jewish people. So in this regard, the anti-Semitic language and imagery that's used to demonize Israel, to portray Israel as the epitome of evil and ultimately worthy of destruction, as well as the boycott campaigns that are, that are the first steps towards that end of eliminating Israel, these are really the weapons of this war of ideas. And those who are wielding these weapons have caused, I would say, significant harm to the reputation of Israel and her supporters both on and off campus. We cannot underestimate how many students have become poisoned by the rhetoric that they hear on campus. The, and and who, are, who are the, the primary sources of this, or one of the two primary sources of this? The MSA and SJP students, and who are they? Who are these students? They are generally motivated by very strong religious and political convictions. They have a fire in their belly. They come to the university. Many of them are foreign students who come from cultures and countries where anti-Semitism is, is, is how they think about the world, right? That there, there's virulent anti-Semitism in the Arab world, and many of these students come from countries where anti-Semitism is perfectly acceptable. In fact, they're, they're fed on a diet of anti-Semitism, and they come to American universities, to California, and they have not been educated about, about what, about what anti-Semitism is. So these student groups often have uh, strong ties to international campaigns to demonize and delegitimize Israel, as well as to organizations like the Muslim Brotherhood. In fact, the Muslim Brotherhood founded the Muslim Student Association, the MSA, 40 years ago. Um, and other terrorist other organizations, al Ada is, is one of the main sponsors of the Students for Justice in Palestine. al Ada is an organization that has ties to both Hamas and Hezbollah. So these are not your ordinary student groups like the young uh, college Republicans or the young Democrats, right? These are, 
these are students who come with a serious agenda, who are, have ties to terrorist organizations. The MSA and SJP students have forcefully promoted their message on campus, and in most cases they have met little resistance. And as a result of the sheer quantity of MSA and SJP materials and events, anti-Israel and pro-Palestinian discourse has really dominated the campus square for over a decade, negatively, as I said, negatively affecting perceptions and attitudes of literally hundreds of thousands of California University students towards the Jewish state. And also, the near success of the boycott campaigns, as, as, as insignificant as the effect on any one campus could possibly be to the state of Israel. So what, so what? So the student government's not going to give money to companies that that uh, do business with Israel, that's not the problem. The problem is they have fueled, the near success of these campaigns have really fueled and encouraged and strengthened the international boycott movement's efforts to delegitimize Israel. And that is a serious problem. And we're seeing it getting stronger and stronger every day. And in addition, you know, the coup de grace, as they say, when lies, distortions, and half-truths about Israel and her supporters are promoted by some faculty in their classrooms and at departmentally sponsored events, what happens is that a cloak of academic legitimacy attaches to them, which really enhances their ability to flourish not only on campus, but around, really around the world. But campus anti-Semitism has also had an enormously pernicious effect much closer to home. And that is that students and professors who use this hateful anti-Jewish rhetoric and imagery and who actively promote the dismantling of the Jewish state and who support terrorism against Jews, they have created a hostile and threatening environment for many Jewish students on California campuses who report, as you heard in the video, feeling unsafe, emotionally and intellectually harassed and intimidated by peers and professors, isolated from their fellow students and unfairly treated by administrators. As a result of their experience on campus anti uh, of, of campus anti-Semitism, some Jewish students have even reported leaving the university. They've reported dropping classes, changing fields of study, avoiding certain parts of campus, and hiding symbols of their Jewishness. That's the bad news. Now I want to talk about the good news, right? Because whenever we feel like we can actually do something, it should fill us with some hope about, about the future. And I think that only if we can really uh, if we can really find successful strategies and effort, and our efforts are going to be uh, directed in this direction to these problems in a smart way, and I'll explain what I mean by a smart way, this, is, this problem is only going to get worse and worse, and we're really not going to win this war, not the war of ideas, and not the war that's being waged on the college campuses against Jewish students there. So, let's see if I can do this. Yes. Um, over the last several years, students, faculty, and community organizations and concerned citizens have really been on the front lines of fighting campus anti-Semitism. They've adopted several strategies. Some have been more successful than others, though none to this point now has really led to a decisive victory. I've divided these strategies into two kinds. Two is a, is a good number, um, and you'll see it a lot tonight. Um, those that have attempted to counter the efforts to demonize and, and delegitimize Israel, and those that have attempted to protect Jewish students from uh, the hostile environment created by Muslim and pro-Palestinian students and anti-Israel faculty. So the two, the two problems, the two effects, right? Going after those two effects are the two general kinds of strategies that we have. So I'm going to start with the first one about countering the de demonization and delegitimization of Israel. So once again, there have been two sets of efforts to counter the uh, demonization and delegitimization of Israel on California campuses. The first set has been directed against the anti-Israel activity of Muslim and pro-Palestinian student groups. Pro-Israel students have really been at the forefront of those efforts, often with material and moral support from Jewish organizations and members of the local Jewish community. These students have engaged in activities that both respond to specific anti-Israel events, right, counter-demonstrations to what we see. I mean, you can see one student holding the Israeli flag as Imam Abdul Malik Ali was spewing his hatred, right? So counter moves or responsive moves, but also those moves that are proactive that seek to create a more positive and balanced image of Israel on campus. Their efforts have included tabling, setting up a table and giving out information, 
um, hosting speakers and events, mounting demonstrations, and as I said, counter demonstrations, making inroads in the student government, trying to work on ha having some student power within the student government to work on these things and writing articles for the student newspaper. However, despite their admirable courage and perseverance, pro-Israel students have found it very difficult, in most cases, to turn the tide of anti-Israel sentiment on their campuses. In large measure, I think, because pro-Israel students are usually far outnumbered and far less aggressive than their anti-Israel counterparts. They don't have the fire in their belly that many of the Muslim and pro-Palestinian students come to even come to university with. The Jewish students just don't have that for many reasons. And the rhetoric, as we know, the rhetoric has just won the day on college campuses, making it difficult to make pro-Israel arguments and to have them even be heard or friendly considered. They say Israel is a racist state, Israel is a, is a Nazi state, and a Jewish student says, no, Israel is not a racist state. And they say, what, are you a racist? What, are you a Nazi? Right? So it takes real courage to stand up to that. And it's very difficult. Most Jewish students I didn't come to university to do this stuff. And in addition, there's one other factor, which is a serious factor for us all here today to consider, which is the fact that Jewish communal organizations have not been uniformly supportive of these student efforts, and in some cases have even hindered them. And we've got to do a lot of soul searching about that. This is an important, this is an important situation where not only are the Jewish students not finding support from some of the mainstream Jewish organizations, including the ones that, find, that are on campus, that are campus-based, but those organizations are often thwarting them, thwarting the most courageous, the bravest, and the best, the best, the brightest, and the most courageous of our students with obstructionist activities. And really, it's, it's, it's bad. Maybe we can talk about that a little after, after my presentation. Recently, however, and this again is the good news, what I want to find, what's, what's been positive, and, and we are making progress, is that, um, and I think that to the extent that we are making progress, is what I call creative coalition building. For example, at UC Berkeley, UC Irvine, and UC San Diego, and San Diego State, actually in San Diego there are two uh, uh, California State Universities there, there have been uh, coalitions of students and some faculty and community members who are working across organizational and ideological lines to help students combat the anti-Israel bias on their campuses. So the second set of efforts is going to counter uh, the anti-Israel faculty. Um, and the second set of efforts, uh, uh, really, I know a lot about since I've been very involved with uh, a lot of them. In 2007, um, alarmed by the rising incidents of anti-Israelism and anti-Zionism on classrooms and at departmentally sponsored events at my university, UC Santa Cruz, like the one exactly, in fact, that was, that was a key event in my life in, in trying to be, uh, combat this stuff. A small group of faculty during this time, a small group of faculty including myself and my husband, Elon, who's also a professor at my university, in fact, it was a very small group, it was just the two of us, we implemented a strategy, we implement, sometimes it's easier when you're working. Uh, we implemented a strategy for raising awareness um, of, for raising the awareness of UCSC uh, administrators and faculty to the problem and encouraging them to aggressively address it. What did we do? Our group presented the chancellor, the head of the university, a divisional dean, and leaders of the UC Santa Cruz Academic Senate, meaning the faculty leaders, a governing body of the faculty. We presented them with a large report of examples of faculty-generated anti-Zionist rhetoric, including that conference that you saw about. And we argued that these were unscholarly, that these were politically motivated and directed, and therefore constituted not legitimate uses of academic freedom, but abuses, abuses of academic freedom. And we urged these university leaders, these faculty and administrative leaders, to investigate our concerns and to address any violations that we would find. We didn't even name names of professors or courses. It wasn't about the individuals or the professors. It was about the whole notion that the university had become corrupted. The academic mission of the university, which is what we argued, had become corrupted, and the university needed to fix it. So we urged these university leaders to investigate and to address any violations that they find. Now, however, of course, both faculty 
Ed administration was uh, very concerned and unequivocally committed to protecting the privilege of academic freedom, neither body was willing to consider the responsibilities of academic freedom or to investigate its possible abuse. The administrators were not willing to enforce the university's own rules, which there are several rules at the University of California, there are several state rules, University of California is a state school, which say that you're not allowed to use the university resources or classroom for political purposes. There are rules, there are state laws, the university administrators are the ones to enforce those laws, they were not doing that, nor were the faculty willing to apply standards of scholarship to ensure that professors educate rather than indoctrinate their students. So now I want to talk about um, another set of efforts. I want to talk about the efforts to protect Jewish students from anti-Semitic harassment on UC students. So there have been, once again, two uh, general approaches. The first seeks to ensure protection for Jewish students under federal law. Um, and I need to give you a little background about that, a little, a little bit of education about federal law and how it applies to Jewish students, so there's a little chronology here. I need you to know that until quite recently, anti-Semitism, and this is, it was surprising when I found this out, but you may know about this, but maybe not, until quite recently, until within 10 years ago, anti-Semitism was not recognized as a violation of U.S. anti-discrimination law, and Jewish students lacked the same legal protections as black students, as Latino students, and even as Arab students. Why? because of the wording of the federal statute called Title VI of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Title VI, which is overseen by the Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights, Title VI requ requires that any federally funded institution, including universities that receive federal funding, which is to say every university in America basically receives federal funding, that they have to ensure that they are free from discrimination based on three categories, race, color or national origin, and if they are found to discriminate in one of those areas, then they risk losing their federal funding. 